I'll take, a, take advantage of that silence to go ahead and start. I'm David Corey. I'm the director of Baylor in Washington, D.C. You have found your way to a Baylor in Washington event. And I thank you for coming. I thank you for your interest in the topic. We, uh, one of the things we try to do at Baylor in Washington is to find topics that we think our fellow citizens struggle to think about, need leadership thinking about, often questions that we ourselves would like to know more about and think about. This particular panel isn't one where we're attempting to teach you anything. Sometimes we do stuff like that. This is one where we really are searchers ourselves. And so this is going to be a topic about forgiveness, a panel about forgiveness as a virtue. We're asking whether that's a political virtue as well as a theological virtue, if it makes sense to think about forgiveness in politics or if something like mercy or some other kind of uh, category might be more appropriate. Um, this will, the arc of the conversation will probably move from a sort of a theological starting point into more the socio-political domain as we go. We try to model civil discourse at Baylor in Washington, and we ask for you to be gracious and charitable towards us as we approach this topic. We have learned over the years that we can be an awful lot more effective with partners, um, and this is, this is a big event you're at. We wouldn't have been able to do it alone, and I just want to read out the names of a couple of the organizations that have come along beside us to help us put this on. One of them is the Murdoch Charitable Trust. They've supported us very, very generously, both on this panel and the last one we did on the fragility of American youth. Um, the Gerald R. Ford Leadership Forum, uh, which is part of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, uh, has also been a very generous supporter, and they are trying to cultivate uh, civic virtues uh, in American political life. And I want to thank um, their program manager, Jeff Paulette, for his willingness to support us. The Faith and Law Society on Capitol Hill is helping Christians on Capitol Hill think about the intersection of their, their faith and the work that they're doing in politics. We also want to thank the Pepperdine School of Public Policy out on the West Coast. They've been very generous and faithful partners of ours. And finally, the magazine Public Discourse, uh, which is part of the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton. Um, they're here, they have a representative here, and they're, they're supporting us. And finally, um, there's a magazine called Comment Magazine. Some of you must read it. It's a really nice, Christian, very thoughtful magazine. And one of the great writers on forgiveness recently is Tim Keller. And they, had, uh, they, they ran an article by Tim Keller, and we have copies of it for you. I was sort of hoping I'd see it in your hands. Not, I don't see it, but there are a ton, some of you have it. There are a, b a bunch that um, Ann Snyder sent over from comment, and I want you to get those, 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 uh, those essays that are available for you for free. Um, I'm thinking I don't need to really introduce the panelists very much because you've got their bios right in your hand and because I think you're here because of who they are in part. <laughs> but uh, Liz Brunig uh, has a background at the Washington Post and the New York Times, um, and she's currently at the Atlantic. When she was at the Washington Post, she was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. Bishop Claude Alexander is a senior pastor for the Park Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he currently serves on the governing boards of Christianity Today, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and the Wycliffe Bible Translators. The Reverend Fleming Rutledge, preacher and teacher known throughout the US, Canada, the British Isles. I'll bet she's known even further than that. Her um, most celebrated book, the crucifixion, understanding the death of Jesus, is the product of the work of a lifetime and is being described as a new classic on the subject. Final note before I introduce my colleague, Matt. He's, he's raring to go. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to note that we always try to take time for Q&A. So if you're thinking about the panel and a question pops up, go ahead and jot it down. And I want you to know that we're going to give you some time to ask it. We, we can never get all the questions, but we try very hard to get as many as we can. So um, please be mindful of the fact that we'll stop in time to, to get your questions. I now want to just turn this over to my colleague, Matthew Lee Anderson. He's going to lead the conversation tonight. Matt has a PhD in theology from Oxford. Um, many of you might know him because he uh, created a, a web platform. I'm, I'm not good on these web things, but I'm too old for this. But there, Mere Orthodoxy. Has anybody heard of Mere Orthodoxy? That's Matt's brainchild. Some of you will have heard. Yeah, clap. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you will, if you're in the academy, you, and even beyond, you might have heard of 100 Days of Dante, which is Matt's brainchild as well. Matt is an incredibly entrepreneurial academic, and I'm very proud to have him as my 
colleague. He's, his position right now is in Baylor's Institute for the Studies of Religion, run by Byron Johnson. Matt, thanks for moderating, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Well, I'm very excited about tonight's thank conversation. You, thank you, thank you. There we are. Wonderful. Thank you. Very excited about tonight's conversation, and I look forward to uh, the thoughts not only of our guests, but your thoughts during the questions. As I was driving, I live in Waco, and as I was driving to the airport, uh, there was a billboard that I passed that I hadn't noticed before, uh, with a 1-800 number, of course, that said, genuine Christians forgive like Jesus. Uh, if you live in Washington, D.C., this is what it's like to be in real America. <laughs> we have billboards reminding people that genuine Christians forgive like Jesus. So I, I want to actually start with that as a question. And Fleming, I'd love it if you would uh, take this in whatever direction you want, and then I'd love to hear from you both as well. Um, how does Jesus forgive? And how is his forgiveness like or unlike our own? And I realize that this is a question that deserves a book <laughs> that you have already written. <laughs> so it's an impossible task. I'm going to begin with a piece of trivia. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. <laughs> I'm used to looking out and seeing faces people that I recognize, people that I can make eye contact with, all I can see is these lights. <laughs> so I'm a little bit at a loss. I'm used to talking to a congregation, you know, but I will do my best. You'll do great. I can see you. <laughs> That's all you need. I can see Elizabeth, I can see Claude. <laughs> and there's no evading the question, however. <laughs> We're in the season following the Feast of the Epiphany, and I've written a little book on Epiphany very recently, so it's on my mind. The first Sunday after the Feast of the Epiphany is a commemoration of Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. I like thinking about a carving I was shown. I've never been there. I've seen a picture of it. On the, uh, it's on a f piece of sculpture at um, the cathedral in Cologne in Germany, Cologne. Mm. And it shows Jesus being baptized, but unlike any other representation of the baptism that I've ever seen, it shows him in the water, and under his feet in the water is Satan. Mm. Now, that suggests a lot of things, but to me it certainly suggests that when Jesus undertook baptism, which was probably very hard for the church to explain, why did Jesus have to be baptized since he was not a sinner? That carving says to me that in baptism, Jesus' deliberate action of coming to John in, at the riverside. And John, of course, protests, I should be baptized by you. You should not come to me. And Jesus says this mysterious thing, let it be so to fulfill all righteousness. Now, righteousness is an important word, which I may refer to later. But the point I'm trying to make with regard to Matthew's question is that... <clears throat> For Jesus to be able to forgive the unforgivable, unforgivable persons and unforgivable people, he needed to undertake the defeat of sin and death himself, personally. And the carver said something in that particular representation, which I, it may be in other places, but I've not seen it. That forgiveness, you see, for Jesus, it cost him more than we can even imagine. 
he had to go into direct combat with sin, death, and the devil, or the world, the flesh, and the devil, there are various ways of putting this. And we can talk about that some more as the evening goes on, but I think I would like to begin by emphasizing that forgiveness was won by Jesus in combat with sin, death, and the devil. And the baptism is the first event of his life in which he undertakes that. Then we follow it through all the way to Gethsemane and the crucifixion. That's what forgiveness cost him. And so human forgiveness has to be understood, I think, in terms of cost. And over and over and over in my researches into forgiveness, I keep coming across this word cost, the cost of forgiveness. I'll let it stay there for the moment. Yeah, that's good. Well, I, taking, that, taking that further, it is not simply the cost, but also the conquest internally for, for him. Absolutely. Um, it's one thing for him to teach forgiveness. And it's another thing for him to speak a word of forgiveness uh, over the man that he sees lowered to the ground and says, thy sins are forgiven, or even the woman caught in the act of adultery, thy sins are forgiven. But it's another thing for him to be on the cross and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they, what they do. To, 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 to speak that, and that is the very first word that comes out of his mouth. After having been betrayed, beaten, spat upon, hung, first word to come out of his mouth is a word of forgiveness. What he had to conquer in himself, what he had to resolve, what he had to fight in himself to be able to speak those words, to be able to be consistent, and to be able to stay on the cross. One of the things that I've, that I've been thinking about. Could I ask you something? Sure. I have to read lips. Sure. So when you have your hand up, okay, I can't okay. do what All you right. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm very, I'm sorry. very deaf. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I will, I will sorry speak Sorry to interrupt, but I really want to hear what you're saying. I will speak louder, Thank and you. I will no, keep just, my. I can read your lips. All right. Um, the consistency of life for him <clears throat> to forgive distantly, and then be willing to forgive with proximity, a consistency. That's, that's number one. Number, number two, I would say that the capacity to forgive is what enables us to remain committed to relationship. And I believe that was important for Jesus, even being on the cross, to, to maintain that posture as Savior, as Redeemer, the one who dies, I have to forgive. And that's a challenge to, to each and every one yeah. of us. Yeah. yeah, that's helpful. Liz, did you want to chime in on this? I know your, your yeah. field is not a little bit different, but sure. you well, know, theological training. I think, uh, you know, when we think about the way that Jesus forgives, he teaches us to pray and ask that we be forgiven as we forgive. So uh, it sets the goal, you know, fairly high. It ties your own fortunes to the uh, level of forgiveness that you're willing to grant to others. It's pretty clever, right? A way of inducing people to forgive because otherwise you have to think, what is inducing people to forgive? Um, which is an interesting question. Because, you know, when forgiveness comes up as a virtue, I think it has a generally good reputation. It's received uh, amiably. Uh, but forgiveness as a process, 
That is when you're giving it, not getting it. That's a whole different story. Um, and so it has to be uh, induced in some kind of way. And, and that's precisely because I think, as, as Reverend Rutledge was saying, there's a cost. Um, when you're injured, this is something that I, I learned as a parent watching my kids. When you're injured, when someone does something bad to you, you get something. It's almost like a, a tort. It creates a piece of property for you. It creates a right. You have now acquired an injury, and that injury comes with a right, and that's the right to plan projects of revenge, right? <laughs> um, that is society's moral go-ahead to get yours, to avenge yourself, to seek recompense, or to seek redress, or just to be righteously angry. Usually when you're just extremely mad about something, you have no real right to be, right? You're just really mad and society kind of looks down upon carrying on that way. Um, but in the case of an injury, you are not only hopping mad and planning to get revenge, you have a right to be and you are justified. And that is an extremely heady place to be for a human being. And so when you are asked to crazily sacrifice that extremely cool kind of catbird seat that you're in, for the person who hurt you, you're sacrificing this real estate you have for the person who screwed you in the first place. That's very difficult to understand. Um, and I think there's a, there's a reason, there's a logic to it that we can get in further to this evening, but that's just to clarify, I think, a bit of, of what's really at stake in, in Jesus' particular case. Your question reminds me of this medieval tradition, um, the Processus Satanae, but they, there's a medieval manuscript tradition in which um, uh, humanity goes on trial, essentially, or, or the devil says, someone has sold me their soul, or humanity has entered into a contract with me in some kind of representative way, and look, I get to take all their souls because God, he's typically speaking to, uh, they're, they're all evil. They sin without fail. They sin against you, and so rightfully they're mine. Now the big problem here is that he's right. And so God has to forfeit, in some sense, his right to pursue divine justice. He has to forfeit his anger. He has to forfeit his wrath. Why would he do that? Well, in the process of Satanai, usually either Jesus, who was a human as well, pleads with God on behalf of humanity, or if Jesus is the one being addressed, the Virgin Mary will plead, plead with Jesus on behalf of humanity as a member of humankind. And the way it resolves is never that it's found that actually the accounting works out and humanity gets to live. Their sins aren't that bad. That's never the way it works out. The contract just gets ripped up. Right? God says, or Jesus says, I'm not going to destroy humankind. We're going to work backwards from there. And the, the math is his anger, his rage, his righteous uh, fury at, against humanity is forfeited as a gift. Not because humanity has earned it, not because uh, you know, we're, we're going to definitely become pious this time, um, but because of God's extreme and overabundant love for humankind. Um, and, and I think, you know, being put in a position to forgive as Jesus forgives is to think about it in that way, that, you know, you get something that's kind of cool when someone injures you in a certain way, right? Because now you can righteously pursue something you're almost never allowed to do, but something we all desire. Um, and the, the cost you're asked you know, to incur here by Christianity is to forfeit that space mm. and to do it basically as a gift, as far as I can tell, for the person who did this to you in the first place. And the reason you have to do that is because they have injured themselves by injuring you. They have lowered themselves. They have lost moral dignity. And you have to ennoble them and raise them back up to have a relationship to keep society basically coherent. Mm. So it's possible that relationships can continue. Um, so when I think about how Jesus forgives, he, he forgives tenderly. Who here condemns you? No one, well, nor do I condemn you. 
that's a great feeling to have someone say that to you. You have no haters, and I'm also not your hater. This is a wonderful message to receive. Yeah, that's a great word. There's, there's lots in all of your comments about the costs of forgiveness for the one who is giving the forgiveness, whether that's the cost that Jesus paid by virtue of his conflict with Satan, uh, the cost of letting go of your claim to vengeance, you know. And I think one of the questions that people wrestle with in this context is when are those costs reasonable or are the costs ever unreasonable? When it, when it comes to Jesus's line on the cross, which uh, Bishop Alexander, you, you mentioned, Father, forgive them. He adds the clause, for they know not what they do. And it's a curious line because does it entail that if they had known what they were doing, they wouldn't be subject to the forgiveness that Jesus offers? And, and I think there's, there's a question there, like if we're talking about the cost of forgiveness and the, the cost that people who are extending forgiveness have to pay by letting down this right, is it the case that they should exact conditions on this gift or is it unconditioned? If they had known what they were doing, would Jesus' forgiveness still extend? Do you wanna take that up? So the first thing that I would, would... Minor question. Yeah, yeah, minor, very, very minor. Um, the participation in the act of forgiveness is the participation in that which defies reason. Um, it is reasonable to exact justice. It is reasonable to seek revenge, to forgive, to cancel, the debt without them paying anything and even perhaps without them even asking for forgiveness. That is unreasonable. It is participating in that which is beyond reason and yet it has its own logic. Grace and mercy. That which is unearned that which is undeserved. And when, and when someone tried to get Jesus to give them, are there any outs? Is there a limit to how many times I have to forgive? Jesus' response was 70 times seven, and then tells this parable about one who was forgiven a great debt and who then would not forgive someone of a lesser as a lesson in terms of to whom much is given, much is required. So. That's good. Do, any, do either of you want to take that up? So I'm interested in hearing what Reverend Rutledge has to say about um, this idea of forgiveness as being something that's difficult to account for with reason, something that, you know, does, does forgiveness... You is know, it a miracle? Well, or does it require you as someone who is a reasoning secular person who's non-religious, does, does forgiveness have enough of its own merits um, for someone who, you know, doesn't, it doesn't have a religious feelings or beliefs to still engage in? Or, or is it strictly, does it really need religious convictions to thrive? I have a, I, I can't talk about forgiveness for very long without um, laying out some essential, I think, essential biblical um, concepts that I believe are essential to an understanding of what forgiveness is. And I don't want to take up a lot of time with this, but I'll try to say a few quick things that might stick in your mind. One of them is that St. Paul never uses the word forgiveness in all of his letters, except when he quotes a psalm. And in one case in 2 Corinthians, he speaks of himself 
being forgiven. But what word does Paul use instead of forgiveness? The word is righteousness, justification. Yeah. Now that, I think, is the key to a great deal of what the gospel is and brings to us that is different from anything else in religion. Um, forgiveness as an action undertaken in imitation of Jesus is profoundly linked to the righteousness of God. And in order to understand what the righteousness of God is, we have to think of it as a verb, to make right. The word um, for justification in Greek and Hebrew is the same as the word for righteousness. And it's not an accident, Paul and scholars think, that Paul doesn't speak of forgiveness because he's so focused on the righteousness of God in justification. And if God can justify, that is to say rectify, make right what is wrong, then the action of a human being in forgiving someone else or someone's others is grounded in the certainty that the promise of God will be true, that God will make all things right. So Christian forgiveness has a dimension that isn't present in the ordinary conception of forgiveness. It carries with it this idea, this promise of God, who is the only, no one but God can keep his promises. That's one thing I really wish President Biden would stop saying, I promise you. Mm -hmm. He says that all the time. Nobody can promise something to another person unless it's really some really small thing because it's almost impossible for human beings to keep our promises. We better be careful about what we promise. Mm -hmm. but God's promises mm -hmm. are ultimately and finally, grounded in the righteousness of God himself. And so, to forgive as a Christian in the name of Jesus is to throw oneself, in a sense, upon the mercy of God who has promised to make all things right. But I return, before I drop that idea for just for a minute, I return to the idea that Forgiveness is extremely costly. And if it's not extremely costly, then it really isn't forgiveness. Harry Emerson Fosdick, of all people, I found this in my notes. I love this. He says there are two kinds of mothers. One of them has no moral depth. She brushes past her son's sin. I love him because he's my son. He's my son, so he can't. Of course I'm going to forgive him everything. That's the first kind of mother with no, no moral mm -hmm. depth, mm -hmm. he says. The other kind of mother loves, forgives, never le lets go of her son, her daughter, ever, but the sin itself turns her hair gray. Mm. And that, I think, is a very important yeah. distinction mm -hmm. between the mother who whose forgiveness is light, cheap, looks past the sin, doesn't take the sin seriously. And the mother who suffers profoundly, mm. never sits, never leaves her son, never leaves her daughter, never abandons her son or daughter, but the action causes her intense suffering over a period of months, years, maybe a lifetime. I think that's a very helpful contrast. It is. I think it drives at what I think one, one of my questions for you, Claude, which is, you know, as you talk about forgiveness being the sort of thing that is in one respect unreasonable or contrary to reason, how, how does that avoid making forgiveness just a magic get-out-of-jail-free card that's always there? Right? Like, 
sometimes in our public discourse, forgiveness has been critiqued in recent years as a concept because uh, it seems like the people who are asking for forgiveness are asking for something that um, they aren't willing to pay any cost to receive. And so I think one, one question that I'd love to hear you reflect on is just when you think about forgiveness and how it relates to the reasons that the one who offers forgiveness has to forgive. How, do, how does that forgiveness avoid becoming just a way of, um, yeah, letting people out of jail for free without holding them accountable for the wrongs that they've done? Well, two things. Uh, first, nobody deserves to be forgiven. Let's start there. Whenever forgiveness is given, it is not because the perpetrator deserves it. It is because the person who decides, who chooses to forgive, does so. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And then, and then the second thing, tying into Fleming's point about God being the one who ultimately makes things right. The classic example that I would go to is the families are in the courtroom in Charleston, South Carolina. It is the first time that Dylan Roof is brought into the, brought to be um, arraigned. They have decided before they entered the courtroom not that they weren't going to say anything. And the standard practice of that procedure was for them not to be given the opportunity mm. to say anything. But that judge on that day decides to give them the opportunity. And with no planning, no forethought, several of them say, I forgive you. Without the young man having made a request, mm -hmm. showing no remorse, but they say, I forgive you. Part of that has to be the trust that God is the one who makes things right. And while it may appear as if someone got a get out of jail free card, the trust is in the righteousness of God. Hmm. What is your about that? Well, I think <clears throat> if forgiveness gets a bad rap, um, it, when it does, it has to do with forms of forgiveness that are kind of difficult to think about because they take place on the level of groups and they, hmm. they have to do with representation. Like a lot of moral work is being done by representation. So oftentimes when forgiveness comes up, people are thinking about social media and they're thinking about people getting canceled or people getting in trouble on social media and then kind of reappearing a few months later um, or a few years later and, and seeking forgiveness. But I, I find those situations to be you know, of a different category than the type of forgiveness that, that Bishop Alexander is describing or um, you know, the ones that we've been dealing with closely here because it's not really clear who's harmed you know, when someone, when someone pops off on social media and says something really stupid and everyone decides we hate them now, it's not even clear that anyone was harmed in this. It's just that someone said something really stupid and it revealed that they're an idiot and now we hate them. Um, but it's, I mean, describing how social media works in the frankest terms, that's how it works. Um, and the fact that they present their, their wish to be re-included in society as a desire of forgiveness, is a desire for forgiveness, doesn't necessarily mean that any user on social media was injured or is entitled to extend them forgiveness. Um, it's, it's rather a case where I think people need mercy. Um, stop being so mean to me, it was a long time ago, is not an unreasonable request, but it's a distinct request from a request for forgiveness, which is, I actually injured you, I know what I did wrong, I'm taking accountability for it, and I need to be forgiven by you because you're the only one who can do it. 
That's when you know you're in a situation where you really need forgiveness. If you're in a situation where you really need forgiveness, you know who has to give it to you. There is usually no unclarity about that. But if you're in a situation where you just sort of ambiently need people to stop treating you like someone who said something really dumb one time, that's probably in a situation where you need mercy. So my children at this age, they're six and three, they rarely need my forgiveness, but they often need my mercy. <laughs> <laughs> And so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to think of it as, as a category error when people mm. are talking about forgiving a politician for having been a liar or something. I'm like, what's new, right? But, um, or forgiving someone who messed up in a public way on social media. That's mm. really a situation where I think it would be more helpful to think along the ter terms of mercy mm. um, than to, to think along terms of forgiveness. Um, and, and I think that those category errors are a lot of what gives forgiveness a bad rap. Now, forgiveness should have a bad rap for how hard it is. That is what it deserves its difficult reputation mm -hmm. for. Um, but it gets a bad rap for letting people off the hook too easy, therefore allowing injustice to continue unchecked, or um, people are afraid of getting tricked in the process of forgiveness and, and looking like a fool or being taken in by someone who is evil and malicious and is just asking for forgiveness so they can go on to continue um, doing evil. Um, you know, these are real hazards of forgiveness. It is possible you will be a fool, a holy fool, <laughs> um, but it's possible to get taken for a ride. I mean, all of these are real injuries that people open themselves up to in the process of doing something as vulnerable as forgiving someone else. Um, but I, I at least think that distinguishing those categories in politics, like Charles Griswold, one of the big philosophical theorists on forgiveness, you know, theorizes political forgiveness and group forgiveness as something else almost entirely different than interpersonal forgiveness. And I think that those categories can help us think through the problem of forgiveness. So if I hear you right, and I'd be interested in hearing all of your account of this, it sounds like you think that forgiveness is not the sort of thing that applies between groups at all? Reconciliation applies between groups. Mercy can apply between groups. And, and something nearing or, or similar to, something symbolic of forgiveness. Um, groups can certainly um, cease to plan projects of revenge. That's sort of the, the peak of forgiveness, right? Is I'm no longer plotting my vengeance. And uh, if I see you on the street, I won't spit on you, etc. You know, You have become an equal to me again. I'm raising you up by forgiving you back to where you belong. Now you're an equal of me in society. Go forth in peace, right? Um, I think that, you know, is, 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 the, is the goal there. Yeah. That's interesting. Fleming, I'd be interested to hear your account of whether forgiveness within the Gospels um, and within Jesus' life, whether it functions in a group context at all. You know, obviously there's you know, uh, the Hebrew Bible. You mentioned Paul, the only time he mentions forgiveness is when he's quoting the Psalms. <laughs> and of course there you have very much a, a notion of corporate solidarity, shall we say, an individual being the bearer of a group identity. Um, and I'm curious, like, how do you think that forgiveness functions with respect to groups? Is it possible for one group to forgive another? Because I think that when we think about forgiveness in a social and political context, a lot hangs on this question right here. Well, I don't think we'll ever see that purely in human life. And I think we can illustrate that, but I don't think that means we shouldn't undertake it. I can, I've got this, this is only a tenth of my file on forgiveness. I've got, it's taken me days to go through it and I'm not through it yet. But I can, the same things keep coming up. And one of the things that keeps coming up over and over and over and over is South Africa and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now that was an attempt to have a whole society come to terms with what had happened. And there's no way that you can say that it was a success. Many people were very upset that 
so many of the criminal elements received amnesty. That was the that was the bargain that was made. They would admit what they had done, and provided that it was a part of the political setup, they would receive amnesty. Now there was a, there are a lot of people that couldn't adjust ever adjust to that. But the way that the process was conducted, and I really have read a lot about this, and I'm sure a lot of you know about it equally, maybe more than I do. The process itself, which took a long time and involved hundreds of people and thousands of hours of hearings and anguish and torment, mental torment for the victims. Um, but it was seen as a kind of watershed um, happening. And it's never been successfully replicated as far as I know. There have been attempts to have truth and commission, uh, truth and reconciliation commissions in South American countries, but they haven't worked as well. For one thing, they didn't have Desmond Tutu, but um, who's not perfect, but Desmond Tutu, Desmond Tutu was an extraordinary human being used by God in that situation, and there's just no way not to acknowledge that. Um, but uh, I read a book, a famous book called A Human Being Died That Night. I'm sure some of you have read it. Uh, the author's name is so complex that I can't pronounce it. I don't think I've ever heard it pronounced, so I'm just going to refer to the book, A Human Being Died That Night. Her name is something like Pumla Gobodo Madikizila or something like that. I can't pronounce it. She spent years interviewing a man whose name, his nickname, so-called, was Prime Evil, which is sort of a mm -hmm. pun on the word Prime Evil. He was a kind of Prime Evil, wicked person. His name was De uh, Eugene de Kock. Uh, he was a Boer, an Afrikaner. And she spent years going to see him and talking to him. And she said this. Um, don't tell me I've lost it. Well, she, her own words are very important, and I don't know where they are. But um, she said, I wanted to understand how another human being could do what he did. He oversaw the torture and murder of scores, if not hundreds of people, for years. He was in charge of the whole operation. And he was imprisoned for, supposedly, for life. I think he was ultimately paroled. Um, but she began to see in him a depth of remorse that she had not expected to see. And because of that, she kept going to see him and kept going to see him over years. And this is what the book is about. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, this raises some interesting questions. What about people who never show remorse? She developed quite a relationship with de, de Kirk, de, Ke de Kock, <laughs> um, in the end, because she sensed discovered that there was a profound sense coming up within him of a sense of what he had done and remorsefulness for it. I believe that there have been some rare figures in human history that nothing can be said about them except that they seem to be barely human at all. Uh, we all know who they are. But most people, perhaps, have something in them that can be reached. And it was reached by this woman who wrote the book. She was able to elicit from de Kock this deeply, deeply buried remorse. But imagine what it cost her. And she mm. writes about the cost of it mm. and the exhausting, prolonged efforts that she made. I expect you can talk about that. 
Yes, so I do a lot of work on death row. I've been to four executions and the autopsy of an executed man whose execution was botched. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking to guys on death row. And um, some are more remorseful than others. I can tell you that both times I've served as a personal witness um, in which you know, I've had the opportunity to talk to the men right before their executions, essentially right up until the time they were put in death watch cell and taken away from all their communication methods, remorse is on their mind at the end. Right? That's, both of them have talked to me at the very end when they thought they were about to die about what they did and how they felt about it. Um, a lot of guys in, in prison, I mean, let me put it this way. I, I was following the case of a, of a woman on death row who was going through a formal mediation process um, where she was going to meet with the victim's family um, and, you know, potentially um, they were willing to, you know, kind of fight to have her given life without parole. They were willing to do that. But the mediation didn't work out because she never really was willing to show remorse. And uh, the way that I understood it was when the mediation specialist would come in and talk to her, she would just become very defensive. And, you know, she had a lot of pain and a lot of difficulty and a lot of stuff she had been through as well that had never really been validated by anyone. No one had ever said they felt sorry for her. Um, and this was basically all she had in her life was her pain and then her conviction. She was very young when she was convicted. Um, and so I think it can be difficult for people to see their way through a lot of pain and suffering to show remorse because it feels like showing weakness or admitting there's nothing good to you. It can feel like you're turning over your whole person to this abjected version of you that's just nothing but the, the thing you did wrong. Um, and I can understand guys, especially on the row, not wanting to show remorse because they want to look tough. They, you know, the world they live in is based on respect and honor and so on. Um, but you know, more often than not, and a, a prison guard told me this, they have a heavy burden they have to carry. And the guard who said this to me said, I feel sorry for them. I see what they have to deal with. Every day, they have to know what they did and think about it. Also, all the other guys know what they did. Mm. And so they kind of live in a Greek chorus that's giving them you know, a hard time, especially if they did something like killing a child. Um, they never forget it. And they carry a heavy weight. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot. I, uh, it's a lot to... I mean, I'm not a therapist or <laughs> trained to deal yeah. with this in any way. Um, uh, but I, I certainly feel like it's, it's my vocation, like it's, a, like it's a spiritual vocation, because it does seem to be, there's something spiritual transpiring when you're talking to someone through their remorse. And, so you're going to keep doing it? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's something I'm, I feel somewhat called to do. So it seems like in this, there's two sides. One is the sense of remorse that they're demonstrating. The other is the sense of empathy that the journalists, uh, the one journalist in your case and you, Liz, and the other, the, the willingness to get inside the point of view of those who are on death row, those who are on the edges or outside of our society's limits for forgiveness. Um, when we think about forgiveness in some of these social and political contexts, I do come back to the Charleston case, uh, Bishop Alexander, because I think there have been probably two instances of public acts of forgiveness mm. that have gone viral, shall we say, to mm. use that term, within the last five years, and uh, five to 10 years, and certainly one was the Charleston case. Um, the second was the case in Dallas of the woman who, um, ostensibly by accident went into a young black man's uh, apartment and shot him, thinking it was her apartment. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, at the trial, at conviction, the brother of the, the young dead man offered his forgiveness mm. to uh, the, the former policewoman. And it's an extraordinary moment of, of forgiveness, and I think they're, they're two interesting cases because in one, the policewoman showed considerable remorse. She offered an apology on the stand as a part of her 
uh, testimony. And, but in the case that you mentioned, Dylan Roof, of course, hadn't right. shown any remorse. I think my, I wonder when we think about forgiveness, whether or not we can forgive groups, whether or not that's too high of an ask. If there are these lesser forms or these nearer forms of forgiveness that we might have, whether it's mercy, what role does empathy and remorse play in that? And how can we cultivate empathy for those who are on the other side of some of our social divides? And what sort of remorse can we expect them to show in order to imitate forgiveness? Well, one, I would say, you know, you mentioned those two as being miraculous acts. Um, and what is in common is not the state of the perpetrator. Yeah. It's the forgiveness of the aggrieved. The what? The aggrieved. Oh. <laughs> and so oftentimes when we when we engage in you know, the foolishness or strength of forgiveness, we, we often want to put it on whether or not the perpetrator is repentant. Mm -hmm. Failing to realize that the act of forgiveness is not simply about the freeing of the perpetrator it is also the freeing of the person having been wronged. I mean, and so I want to read, I want to read a couple of quotes. Um, Lewis Smedes wrote these words. The first and often the only person to be healed by forgiveness is the person who does the forgiveness. When we, genu when we genuinely forgive, we set a person free and then discover that the person set free was us. The success of the truth and reconciliation effort in South Africa was perhaps simply in what it prevented. Hmm. There was the fear that the black South African would in turn do to the white what was done to them. And what that process set in motion was a breaking of the cycle of karma and quote unquote justice. The amnesty was in many ways a just, an act of justification. Yes, it was. Just as if they had done nothing, nothing wrong. Um, if I may say so, I have um, really studied the black church, both in person and in my reading for decades. And the black church is no more perfect than the Episcopal church, which I'm part of. I'm not, I try really hard not to romanticize the black church because I have a tendency to romanticize the black church. But allowing for the fact that the black church is not perfect, I just want to say that, and I think this is really important, the thing that the black church does with surpassing sensitivity and faith is to put forgiveness and justice together. And you said that already. But I want to underline that, that when you have this deeply rooted tradition of forgiveness and restitution and redemption, which is often commented upon with regard to the black church, but what is not so often commented upon is the way that the black church has been able over the decades, over the centuries, to have these two things together. Fannie Lou Hamer famously said when she was beaten and tormented and mm -hmm. suffering through the, the Mississippi vote struggle, she said, they know not what they do, quoting the King James. 
And that, of course, does bring again the question of what about if they, what about people who don't know what they're doing? But for Fannie Lou Hamer to say something like that, when she was beaten to a pulp in a jail by a big man, this little woman, and she says they do not know, they know not what they do, um, obviously entering into the passion of her Lord. Hmm. That's very humbling and very uh, important for white people to remember. And I think I mean, the thing about both Jesus' utterance and, and Fannie Lou Hamer's is like, they, yes, they did. Right. They did know what they were doing. Uh, they knew they were doing the crucifixion. Um, and, and in this case, they knew they were beating a woman. And uh, in, in both cases, it seems like you have someone who's going rather far out of their way to supply a reason, some reason, any reason, really. Um, and maybe diminished culpability is you know, the one you finally fall back on. Well, they were a kid. Well, they didn't really understand it. Well, they were intoxicated in some way. They this is the way you fall back um, when you're trying to excuse someone. Um, and in both cases, I, I think you get a glimpse of how deeply, how, how generous Jesus Christ is, how overflowing and abundant the desire to be reconciled to humanity is, such that you have that uh, you know, attempt, that, that offering, that extension of a lifeline to these people who were killing him. Um, and I, that has to be, I think, in the, in the DNA of, of Christian forgiveness, at least. For, forgiveness is a political value. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, does that carry over? We live in a liberal democracy. Um, certainly some people are going to be practicing forgiveness with that legacy of forgiveness, with that heritage in mind. Um, but there has to be a practicable form of forgiveness that um, you know, can be concretely applied in cases like South Africa and cases where there are other reconciliation efforts, but also, I think, in criminal justice where we're dealing with penalties every day. Yeah. Um, we'll take your questions here in just a minute. We'll have a couple of students who will be walking around with microphones. I will try to maintain an orderly queue, but <laughs> I'll be patient with me. I'll do the best I can. Um, but before we do, so think of your questions now. Um, I'm curious about, in the, the social and political context, so much anxiety about forgiveness, I think, is tied mm. to forgetting. Mm. And when we think about things like the Holocaust, to pick a major moment where we, we, we are committed to remembering yeah. that mm -hmm. as a society, um, you know, never forget is, is the rallying cry for it. I'm curious how forgiveness intersects with memory and as we think about some of our social, political, racial divisions, mm. how can we remember wrongs yeah. as a people while without reimposing the guilt for those wrongs on the groups that committed them time and time again? Mm. This is really a huge question, especially right now when yeah. um, there's so much pushback against um, critical race theory and so forth, the idea that little children are being made to feel guilty and bad because of something that their ancestors did. Um, th this is really right in front of us. But I was much struck by something Christopher Hitchens said. Uh, he said something to the effect that Forgiveness is immoral. And I've heard, I've had a few Jewish friends who have said that. Mm -hmm. That to forgive, in fact, Elie Wiesel supposedly said, I didn't get the chance to check on this, in his 50th anniversary address, 50th anniversary of the Holocaust, he offered a prayer in which he said, God of forgiveness, do not forgive the murderers of these Jewish children. I think that's an exact quote, if it's a correct quote. Now, I think we need to think very seriously about that. Um, is forgiveness immoral? And in a way, 
in the case of the Holocaust and South Africa and what's been done, what was, what was done to slaves in America and a thousand and one other examples of the inhumanity of human beings to other human beings. Um, I think we could say forgiveness is immoral, except for this eschatological promise that God not only will make all things right, That's right, but that he is presently making things right in the small yes. actions that human beings and groups of human beings take to repair yes. what has been done. And certainly the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was an example of that what the South African woman did in going to see Dukak over and over again is an example of that. What she's doing is an example of that. What the black church is doing is an example of that. Little tiny, or maybe not so tiny, um, efforts to live in this present evil age, as Paul called it, um, the promise of rectification, justification, same word, um, God making all things right. Hmm. And we have seen that, I think, in the faith of uh, Desmond Tutu, who have loved to say, I've read the end of the book, we win. Right. Talking about the book of Revelation. Philip Yancey sort of addresses this in his book, What's So Amazing About, about Grace. Um, who is this? Philip Yancey. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he writes, resentment clings to the past, relives it over and over, picks each fresh scab so that the wound never heals. Not to forgive imprisons me in the past and locks out all potential for change. That's hope. That's an important piece. I thus yield control to another, my enemy, and doom myself to suffer the consequences of the wrong. But this is what really gets me. He says, I once heard an immigrant rabbi make an astonishing statement. Before coming to America, I had to forgive Adolf Hitler. He said, I did not want to bring Hitler inside me to my new country. And the, the, the piece about, again, the power of forgiveness is the refusal to carry inside of you the perpetrator of the wrong. It is, it is to release so that they are no longer inside you as you seek to engage a future. And I don't know if we're able to inject that in the public square, but maybe that might be a great ambition to do so. Hmm. Did you want to take it up, Liz? Sure. I think I think you know when we talk about forgiveness as a as a political virtue and as a public virtue, you know the way I always pitch it when I'm pitching it to people who are not who don't share my faith. Is just, you know, you, do you want to live in an egalitarian society? Do you want people to be equals? Do you want people to be moral equals? Well, when someone hurts you, when someone does something bad, when they violate a moral rule or norm or law or whatever you want to think of it, they deface themselves. They have now become someone who does bad things to people. Mm -hmm. This is a bad thing to be. They have taken themselves down a notch in the great moral hierarchy of people, and they are no longer your equal because you're their innocent victim and they're your perpetrator. And this is a situation only you can fix. Only you can raise them back up. Only you can make them your equal again. And you can only do that by discharging the debt. You, you just have to say, uh, never mind. I'm, I'm not going to pursue any vengeance. And I'm not going to pursue any attacks on your status or reputation. Um, you know, go, you're forgiven. And you know, maybe your answer is, no, that would be immoral. They, they have defaced themselves, and they should be punished, and I'm going to see to it that they are. In that case, my question is still, OK, but how do they ever get back? 
You know, even if you're going to pursue that vengeance, how do they ever get back to where they were before? Or is it just impossible? Agnes Callard at the University of Chicago, she wrote a great essay in the Boston Review on anger. And she points out that if you're angry at someone, if they've angered you, there's no logical reason that you should ever stop being angry at them. Because that injury, whatever it is, it exists in perpetuity and you can never go back in time and undo it. It's always with you, unless. And then I wrote an essay in response saying, unless you're willing to sacrifice that injury, you're willing to sacrifice your rights to pursue vengeance in order to restore the other person to their place in the world. And I think that's you know, an overlapping consensus version of of what we do inside the Christian faith that maybe could work mm -hmm. in a liberal political framework. Good, that's helpful. I'll take questions from the room. Just go ahead and throw your hand up and I will uh, direct people. So we've got one down here. Where's, where's my, hey, yeah. So a lot of attention is paid to forgiving those who've wronged you or those who've wronged someone you care for. But like, um, so, how, how would like the ability to forgive oneself factor into this too? Mm -hmm. um, the ability to be able to say, hey, um, like how, how would that, uh, mm -hmm. how would, would, would that factor into the ability to forgive others? Mm -hmm. Any of you can take that up, so. Claude, do you wanna start? So, usually, or in many cases, the hardest person to forgive is oneself. Because of, of, a, of a standard to which we often hold others, we, we then want to hold ourselves to that as well. And if I find it hard to forgive others, I will usually find it even more difficult to forgive myself. I think at the root, it is believing that I am worth forgiving. That I am, I am worth forgiving. And that's got to sink deep. That regardless of what I've done or did not do, I am worth forgiving. It starts there. That's good. Fleming, did you want to take that up? You look like you might. Um, well, first of all, I didn't hear the question, unfortunately, so maybe not. I'll wait until you can. I, I'm just so hard of hearing. I that's fine. Yeah. I'll, okay. yeah, that's good. Well, um, there's a question. Uh, I know just, what I will say in response yeah, to good. Claude, though. Please do. I, <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, yeah, go oh, for this it. is quick. I, um, I don't have any trouble forgiving myself. <laughs> That's not my problem. I, uh, Bill Clinton didn't have any trouble forgiving himself. I ran into that over and over again in uh, my um, files. That at the time of Bill Clinton's so-called apology, it was widely noted that he fully expected to be forgiven and he had no trouble moving on. I don't know what on, went on with him at home, but uh, Gary, Gary Wills said, uh, that uh, if, you, if, if you just say you're sorry, you're shrugging it off. Bill Clinton, he said, fell short on contrition. In the early church, sinners were required to undergo a period of public humiliation and expressing sorrow before taking, being taken back into the community. Thus saith Gary Wills. Yeah. <laughs> Good, we've got a question down here in the front. Uh, right, right back there, sorry. Third row. Yeah. You may have partly just answered my question. So I was still feeling this tension between accountability mm -hmm. and forgiveness. Forgiveness addresses the evil of the past. Accountability, you hope, structural and individual, has the potential to constrain evil of the future. And I think that's where people get nervous, like, we want to stop what's happening. And if there's no, uh, there's no constraints on that, um, if it's too easy, but maybe you just address that, so. 
I mean, another way of putting the question would be, and maybe Liz, this, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. In a society where we have declining trust in institutions, mm. one thing that, which we've talked a lot about through our events here at Baylor and Washington, one thing that goes along with that is a lack of accountability for the actors in those institutions, or at least a lack of trust that the institution will hold its members accountable. Yeah. In that sort of environment, doesn't forgiveness become way more dangerous because we can't, we're being asked to offer forgiveness to these offenders or wrongdoers, but we can't actually trust the institutions of accountability to hold them to account. Should we value forgiveness in that sort of context? So forgiveness, you know, I think when you really drill down to the root of it, you need love. Um, you need some kind of regard for the other, and, and even in my secular pitch for forgiveness, you have to desire that the other person be your equal. You have to want that for them. And in some sense, that means you have to will their good. You have to love them. Um, and you know, this is built right into the Christian tradition. I, I think there's a, you know, a, a general sense of comedy and brotherhood and so on that's built into the liberal political tradition as well. Um, and so you know, I don't know if it functions without that. Um, I, I don't know what kind of system you have where you have a forgiveness that um, isn't aimed at, a, you know, a sort of ongoing reconciliation. Um, with institutions, especially in a low trust environment, um, I, I mean, it, it becomes very hard to imagine people going for forgiveness because they're afraid. Um, they're afraid of what's going to happen to them or what they may permit to happen to other people if they are um, forgiving. And you know, we have this passage in, in about fear driving out love. I mean, they are, they're difficult to bring together, right? They are sort of oil and water. They push each other in opposite directions, fear and love. Um, and so you know, I think working through a low trust environment where you have a lot of fear is incredibly hard, but it's hard on the politics, it's hard on the expressions of faith, it's hard on every level of society, and I think you know, it's, it's a bigger question than just forgiveness. It impacts every level of our civic functioning. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of other questions, uh, which I like to see, so I'm gonna go on this side over there, down uh, Michael, and then saw other hands there. Thank you for the wonderful conversation. Um, so I, I, I really am taking your point, Liz, about uh, so much of what we call forgiveness in public, maybe mercy sort of applies more. I kind of want to talk about, up? though, or, or have you... Stand up. Sure, sure, sure. Um, would, would kind of want you to um, explore or just think about to, to, to what extent is our public life and politics affected by... Um, private, interpersonal uh, things that have not been forgiven that are then played out in public, or the things that people cannot imagine forgiving interpersonally that then is sort of um, uh, uh, poisons our, our public life. And um, I think, you know, you could think about, I, I know, Liz, you think about the death penalty a lot, and I think you often hear people say, well, I, I could never forgive someone who did that to to my family member, and so that's why the death penalty must be in place. Uh, but I think that this is rampant through our public life, this sort of, I can't imagine forgiving someone in my own life for this, and so politics is a way of sort of enforcing the penalty that we think people deserve. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that, that people's private pain and their private fears and their private struggles that play out on a small scale in their own lives and take on a, you know, this sort of uh, exaggerated form in politics. There's actually a recent story that I was following about a woman named Megan Hall. She was a police officer in a small town in Tennessee. And a bunch of people in her police department were fired slash disciplined because she had had sexual relationships with a bunch of people in her police department. She was married. And then it came out that her husband forgave her. People were really mad about that. People were really mad at her husband for forgiving her. And not only were they mad at her husband for forgiving her, 
they had political reasons for being mad that her husband was forgiving her. This says something about men and women and being cucked or whatever in this modern, horrible era that we live in. Um, and I was reading through these comments. I love reading the comments. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was, I was forming the exact same impression that you seem to have formed, which is this is a lot of private fears and private anxieties and private struggles that are finding a channel here, which is to punish this woman um, and to, to punish even her husband, who is now being treated as complicit in his own injury um, because he is forgiving. And that, that gives us some information about kind of where society is on the forgiveness front. Now, curiously, simultaneously, Lindsay Clancy, this woman in Massachusetts who killed her three children and attempted to take her own life, her husband also posted um, a, a request that everyone forgive her and said that he forgives her himself. And he, he sort of said, she's mentally ill, I forgive her. I would like it if everyone else forgives her. The comments on that were very positive. People were expressing their willingness to forgive. Mental illness is something they can understand, right? Maybe that's something they've experienced in an entirely different way in their lifetime. And so there is a negative aspect to people's private struggles in forming their politics, but there's also a positive aspect, which is if you can reach people through a different channel, if you can help them look at things in a slightly different way, um, then it's possible that forgiveness becomes more palatable to them if they can only imagine those situations in a, in a different light. I mean, that's my hope, at least. Hmm. We, get, we got a question from, we actually have some people who are watching online, so we, I'll take one question from there. Um, can we forgive people in the abstract, as in forgiving people who say might be racist without knowing anything about their identity? And I think one thing that I'm interested in the, with this question is the way in which forgiveness does intersect with people's identities. We forgive members of a class, you know, mm -hmm. forgive people who do this sort of thing. And extending forgiveness to one person like that, it seems like we're extending forgiveness to everyone who fits that sort of class. So can we forgive in the abstract in that sort of way? I don't think you can just like, I forgive the bourgeois. Yeah. <laughs> you you might not be able well, to. Well, no, I mean, I, I, just, <laughs> I, I guarantee, uh, it just like seems Fleming, like, some of us right, have right, no problem. Right, 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 it, just, right, right. <laughs> it just seems like, what does that even mean at the point that you're, you, yeah, you're no longer going to, to attack them? <laughs> Were you? <laughs> Did you have projects of revenge <laughs> plotted against them? And now you're like, but I'm putting all that away. No comment. <laughs> um, that, I, I think that when you're, you know, you have to think about forgiveness as a process. It's not just a virtue. And so if there's no process, if it's impossible to kind of formulate a process, it, it becomes much, much more of an abstract thing, I think. Yeah, good. I think in, in some ways it is, it is done without even knowing that you're doing it. Um, I, think of my, I think of my dad. Uh, you mentioned Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, my dad was one of her physicians. Hmm. Um, Dr. Robert Smith. He, uh, John Perkins talks about being beaten and left bloodied in a, in a jail cell. Well, my dad was his doctor in the jail cell. And yet, when you think about John Perkins and how he has lived his life, he, he had every reason to be unforgiving toward a race. And yet, he chose to be the opposite. And so I think, yes, it is, it is possible that that can be done. And more often than not, it's being done without people even knowing it, that they're doing it. Well, mm -hmm. John Perkins was really something. One of the things that, this is a little bit on the subject, I think. Uh, one of the things that emerged from my reading about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was that there were certain black uh, people who were engaged in the discussions about uh, truth and reconciliation who made a great effort 
to understand why the Boers, the Africanos, felt so injured. And that was a very difficult work for them to do because it didn't look to, me, to them as if the Boers had been injured. The Boers were flourishing and they were very sure of themselves and they had all this land. And, but uh, gradually as the English began to take over and consider themselves cons uh, uh, several levels above the Africanas socially and so forth, uh, and that was the least of it. These particular black people made a big effort to understand the Boers, the Africaners, and what they felt they had lost, and how they felt injured, and how they felt looked down upon, and mistrusted, and mistreated. And it, in a way, it seemed absurd to them, because it was nothing compared to what the blacks endured. But they made that effort, and that helped. That helped a lot in the process of the reconciliation, such as it is. I mean, of course, it's not a complete reconciliation by a long, long way. But the progress that was made was partially because they, as a group, tried to understand what another group had endured. Now, that ought to be what we are doing, white people in the United States, ought to be doing, but not in such a doggone self-righteous way. I do think there's an awful lot of virtue signaling involved in um, many of the social movements that we see that are dividing us. And I deplore that myself because it seems to me to be counterproductive. I think that to understand another, the suffering of another group is hard work and takes a lot of self-abnegation and to be trumpeting how virtuous white people are who are on the right side of all these questions, I think is counterproductive. There's a lot of that in the mainline churches. Mm. Hmm. Great. We'll, we'll take other questions. There was one in, hand in the back there that I saw. There. Oh, hi. Um, I'm just wondering, thinking about forgiveness and the idea of raising the other person up, what about times where that person really shouldn't be back to where they were? So I'm thinking about like pastors who have done really deplorable things and then, you know, there's been conversations about whether they should be able to be pastors again or, you know, a spouse that betrays you in some way and you make the choice to walk away from that marriage. What does the Christian duty look like post forgiveness um, with someone that no longer seems safe? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I don't mean restoring them to all their former uh, you know, positions of authority, for example, especially if in the offense they had exploited a position of authority. Um, I, I certainly don't mean you need to elevate them socially. Um, I just mean as, as moral equals, right? They're no longer a person who owes you a debt, um, you know, a person upon whom certain projects of vengeance can be perpetrated without any ill effects returning to you, right? If someone is in the position of currently owing you a debt, you have the right to take something from them or do something to them without any repercussions for yourself because you're justified in what you do. In forgiveness, all you do is you say, I, I have this right here and I'm putting it in the trash, I'm forfeiting it. You're no longer someone who has a lien on your existence, right? Go forth in peace. But that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, now we're best friends again or you go right back to the position you were in, you know, in power. Um, I think that, that that's a distinction I would make there. Yeah. yeah. Good. This is really helpful. There's a question way in the back. I want to make sure that I... <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much for all of your conversation tonight. I'm really interested in hearing about having mercy on oneself if you're not ready to forgive someone and also extending that mercy to others when you think that they should have forgiven someone already. See, I'm, I'm Catholic. We don't do this forgiving yourself business. <laughs> <laughs> Completely off limits. And, um, <laughs> Thank you. That's great. I go get forgiven occasionally by a guy. Yeah, in a booth. yeah. <laughs> As it should be. Did you want to take that up? What was the question? I'm, 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 <laughs> yeah, I think we might have. We might need this one again. Having mercy on yourself if you're not ready to forgive. Yeah. yeah it's, um, 
Oh, it's um, having mercy like on oneself when you're not ready to forgive someone or having mercy on someone else if you think that they should have already forgave them. Yeah, how do, yeah. How, do, how do we have mercy on ourselves if we're not ready to forgive someone? What do we do if someone has injured us and we're not ready to forgive them? Well, I think one is realize being honest, mm -hmm. first of all. This is where I am, and this is where I am not. Um, and so that's number one, being honest. Secondly, um, recognizing that it is a process that includes feelings, but is not limited by feelings. Right, that's the, that's the second piece. The third is, um, is seeking, seeking God to get you to the point where you want to be. It is God who causes us both to will and to do his good pleasure. And so believing that to be true and valid even in that instance. Hmm. Fleming, since Liz has recused herself from answering this right, question. Right, right, well, right, I, I, right, yeah. right, right. Do you want to add anything to that? I didn't hear the question. <laughs> what should people do if they're not ready to forgive? Well, I'll just tell a story. Um, when I was a very young priest uh, 45 years ago, um, I was working under the rector of the church, and he was new. I had worked, I was hired by one rector and he retired, and then the new rector came. And um, it was a very exciting time. I thought he was wonderful, and I really liked him, and I liked his wife. And no more than a year into his tenure, he decided he was going to get out of the marriage. And there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the gist of it. And it did so much harm to the parish, so much. His wife was just undone, and his grown children were undone. And I was just disgusted with him and couldn't get past it. He was eventually fired, but there were months there where I had to work with him every day. And I continued to see his wife and to try to do what I could to support her. She was just left in the lurch completely. Another woman was involved. Mm. And it just did so much damage to the church. And for years, years, I just could not feel anything other than contempt and loathing for this man. Uh, because he was fired, I didn't have to see him every day, but he was still around. And it wasn't for several more years, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, that I saw him at a diocesan meeting. And I realized that somehow it was gone. My loathing of him was just lifted off of me. Hmm. I didn't do that. I suggest that all of us recognize that this can happen okay. and ask for the Lord to work it in us. Hmm. We can't work it in ourselves. Yeah. It's something the Lord can work in us. And the Lord was good to me and worked it in me, and I didn't even ask him to. Hmm. But I sure ask him now. <laughs> This is, this is good. I've, we've got a lot of questions in the queue. We're going to go a little bit longer than 830. I'm not going to ask for your forgiveness for that because I'm not <laughs> doing you any wrong. So uh, I also realized I've had a this side of the room bias because I'm faced this way. So I want to make sure I'm attentive to people over here as well. So we'll take a question down here at the front. But if you've got a question on this side of the room, make yourselves yeah. known. Th thank you. So it occurs to me that it is critical in any discussion. I'm right, right here in front of you. Oh, yeah, it, is, it seems that it is critical in any discussion of forgiveness that there's a discussion of moral wrong. And so how do we, what role does having an objective understanding of moral wrong play in forgiveness 
when much of what is being defined as moral wrong today is subjective. That what is wrong is being determined to be not wrong, and what is being determined to be not wrong is in fact wrong. And how do we, how do we understand forgiveness in a culture where moral wrong is not even agreed upon? Good. Who's pointing at <laughs> I, I think Claude wants to I'll hear from you. you. Yeah. Oh boy, that's a really yeah. important question. Yeah. It's one that we're all trying to live with, I think. And this is where um, I, at least, have found a tremendous amount of guidance and comfort in understanding that the Christian community has its own work to do. We cannot really hope to change the culture. Maybe we can change the culture. Maybe the Lord will see to it. But the Christian community within itself is called to a particular kind of life, which is described in the Beatitudes by Jesus, which is not proscriptive but descriptive, which has been said so often. In the Beatitudes, we see a description of the body of Christ. And if the larger culture is going to hell in a handbasket, which it seems to be doing, um, our responsibility is to be the church, to be the body of Christ, to be the community that lives in the spirit of our master, our friend, our redeemer, lives in his spirit, by his spirit, by the power of his spirit. And I see a lot of evidence of the power of this just in observing my fellow Christians who are flawed and damaged just as we all are, but who mm-hmm. are raising children in faithful marriages and who go and visit the sick and who make friends with the black congregation in the next community. and take on the Afghan refugees who have arrived. and them, I know that sounds sort of trite, but I was helped in this by reading something by um, Rick Lisher, who was professor of homiletics for a long time at the Duke Divinity School. And he wrote something that's been com- become quite no- well known about the uh, Sermon on the Mount, which is hard to, I think, write about and hard to preach and hard to understand because it comes across as as prescriptive and not descriptive. But uh, Rick Lisher writes at some eloquent length about how the Sermon on the Mount is descriptive of the Christian community. It is not an ethic for society. It is what the Christian community is called to do and to be. And that is leaven. That is salt. Hmm. And if we trust that and believe that, and have faith in God's power to do that in us in spite of ourselves, then we are being the body of Christ in spite of the society and its apparent complete loss of any kind of mooring, um, which is very distressing to see. But we have something that we do within Mm -hmm. the community of faith, which is not our own. Uh, Liz, can I hear your take on this as well? You've alluded to liberalism a couple of times now. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's one great way of solving the problem of moral disagreements. Is it the case that... uh, Solving, I mean... (laughs) Thank you, yeah. No, it's it's actually an important... That's one way of pouring a lot of gasoline. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Not a way of solving, a way of managing. Managing. Disagreements about... Right, so... significant moral problems. For me, this is a question that is just, you know, you could, how does forgiveness function when you have people with vastly different comprehensive doctrines going on? You have people who view the moral universe in radically different ways. So you're like, hey, you injured me. And this person is like, I did not. I had no obligation to you in this circumstance. And you're like, well, in my belief, you did. Um, I mean, I think, you know, interestingly, in matters of like moral violation, Americans tend to, I think, bunch up in pretty reasonable ways. Um, 
but I, I understand that you know people are changing all the time. When you ask how to do it, I mean the answer that liberalism has come up with is like, well, badly, you know, <laughs> speaking. Um, we'll just uh, we'll we'll talk past each other and miscommunicate a lot, and uh, we'll have factional aggression. Um, and I mean, I think that that's liberalism when it's working. <laughs> um, when it when it completely breaks down is when you just you know, have the groups just decide to wage war on each other. And um, so I think at this point the answer is you know how do we do it? Well, badly, you know. But that's liberalism working. Hmm. I think the other part is is how do you see what you do as bearing witness? Right, and if you, and if you see your life as that which seeks to bear witness, then regardless of how others see right or wrong or come to a judgment whether forgiveness is needed or not, it is what you know, and it is what you choose to do, and in so doing, you serve as a witness in the midst. That's good. We're going to take one more question. So we'll go right here. Uh, go ahead and stand up. There's a microphone coming right behind you. Yeah, so I was just thinking, um, Fleming, when you um, had said earlier about God's righteousness, that you were going to expound a little bit further about as we went on. But I was thinking of one of my favorite passages in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 11 to 21, about God's message of reconciliation. And so I was just thinking about how he says that, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. It's amazing that you're quoting that. I was just thinking that. Oh, OK. <laughs> And it says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old has gone, the new is here. And all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, and God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I was just thinking of what you said in the beginning about when he was baptized and the righteousness that when he looks at us after we become a Christian, we, mm -hmm. we are made righteous in his sight. And so he doesn't see our sin, and that's what he compounds us mm. to, compels us. So I don't know how the, the question. Most, that's the most wonderful passage. D does anybody here remember a magazine called Catalogate? Even one person out there? Hey! Wow. And in the front <laughs> row as well. Uh. Catalagate is the word in Greek that is translated in that parish, in that passage, be reconciled. And it's funny because the people who wrote that, who put that magazine together, the great, great, great Will Campbell, the unique, wonderful Will Campbell, um, and his sidekick, Jim Holloway, um, they were the least prescriptive people in the world. They didn't go around saying, be reconciled, be, as if it was an imperative. The idea is, you are already reconciled in Christ, so be reconciled. And it's that passage that they got that from. Mm -hmm. Another passage that I think of in the Corinthian correspondence is, um, I think it's 1 Corinthians 7, but I can't remember. It's called the as though not passage. Live in this world as though not, for the form of this world is passing away. And that's uh, the eschatological dimension in which we can take heart that this world that we're seeing right now is not the ultimate world. It feels like it. And it feels hopeless right now, I think. 
but the form of this world is passing away. Can I, can I ask in closing, um, as you think about forgiveness and the problems that we have as a society, even if we can't, uh, if we don't want to be prescriptive and run around telling people forgive, 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 because no one wants to be, uh, you know, commanded, commanded into it. Into it. What are some of the practices that we can undertake as a people to prepare ourselves to forgive our enemies and those we disagree with? And I want to hear from each of you on this. So, I'm going to start again. I can't stand the word practices. <laughs> if anybody tells me about practices, I just want to run the other way. <laughs> I have never been any good at practices. I'm serious. It's a new word. We're not, I didn't hear anything about practices when I was coming along. Yeah. We didn't talk about practices. We talked about prayer and worship. And we, but to me, the idea of practices is like giving things up for Lent, which I never was any good at. I'm no good at meditation. I'm no good at any of these spiritual exercises. I believe in the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. Okay, how's that for a speech? <laughs> I, I, I encourage our participants. I, I got what I asked for. I told, I, told, I told our participants beforehand, answer the question that you want to answer, not the one that I asked. So thank you, Fleming. That was wonderful. Well, I'm sure that you're going to, we'll get a lot, a lot of edifying responses now that I've said my bit. <laughs> yeah. Liz, do you want to throw my question under the bus in the same way? When, I, when my friends text me about something, um, like a, a bad that's gone on with them and someone else, like you know, somebody at work is annoying them or something, I say, you know, like, do you want my shtick or do you want a hater response from me? Because I'm totally glad to just hate on this person with you. They're never going to know. And you know, I, I understand that's probably what you need right now. Um, or do you want my shtick, which is like, I'm sure they have their reasons. <laughs> you know, what good is it to meditate on this now? You know, big imagination, big negative capability, let it come to you, their reasons. Look through their eyes. They probably didn't really mean anything by it, yada, yada. <clears throat> or would you just like me to go to town on this person with you? Because I can also do that. Um, but I mean, I think you have to, you know, you have to kind of exercise both muscles. And, you know, you get angry in life, but. Every time I get angry at somebody and I'm really mad, I also do the other thing in my head. And, and I, it's like the price I charge myself for getting mad. Hmm. Is if, if I want to like have a nice hater session on someone, like I'm going to sit down and just get pissed at somebody. <laughs> I have to pay the toll of then sitting there with myself and being like, OK, but actually, I don't really think that I'm being exaggerated here. Um, and that's, a, that's how I just do it in the, on the level of emotional regulation. You mentioned negative capability. That is something to be cultivated. Is cultivating something a practice? Maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> but negative capability, a phrase of John Keats, is something that it would be wonderful if everyone had it because it means you're not always rushing for an answer to everything. You're not always trying to tie everything up into a neat package. You're not always trying to apply a label to something or a slogan to something or fit something into a labyrinth it, 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 or a, an Enneagram or a negative capability. <laughs> uh, that, that's called um, a horoscope for Episcopalians. <laughs> 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 um, but seriously, I think that uh, cultivating negative capability, the ability to remain in doubt and in security in, 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 the, in the subordinate ways is one of the most freeing things hmm. that I've ever heard. That's good. That's How very did helpful. you mean it when you said it? You seem to be sort of saying it was just one more thing to pile on. Oh, it was precisely like that, having a big imagination and letting what's going on with someone or their interior world come to you. But you have to be open to it. I mean, as a journalist, I have to do this because when I'm writing a long form piece, I'm writing characters. And I have to have a, a good understanding of a character. 
um, to, to draw out the piece and make it read literarily. And so, um, you know, the big negative capability, I find it to be very useful personally as well because mm. it allows me to understand people's worlds. I guess that's <laughs> one of the reasons that I think journalists are really to be held up in our society. Karl Barth prayed for journalists all the time. We need it, yeah. Thank <laughs> yeah. Good, that's very helpful. Bishop Alexander. So for me, it is uh, making the determination how long I want to allow somebody to live within me that's not paying rent. <laughs> and if they're not paying rent, they don't deserve to live within me. And therefore, I need to release them. That's a good word. Um, I don't know that we've solved <laughs> any of the problems of forgiveness or uh, no. fully explored the politics of forgiveness, but I think we've gotten a really robust account of some of the questions that are involved, and I've benefited from this immensely. So will you join me in thanking our speakers? Back to you. I want to say as well, thank you to you for your time and attention. If this is your first time at a Baylor and Washington event, we'd love to get to know you. Uh, find one of us, come up and talk with me, our director, Dr. David Corey. Uh, Molly Moore and Beth Butler are there in the back. So uh, thanks to them for all their support. Thank you to our uh, sponsors as well. Uh, and thank you really to you. I think that the question of forgiveness remains a very live one. And I think it's indicative of how important it is that you've given your time and your attention to it this evening. And that itself is very encouraging to me. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful night.